Field Eyes. Thirteen point seven billion years ago, from nothing, the universe as we know it flashes into existence. Ten billion years later, the first life forms appear on Earth. Evolution takes its course as the peaks and valleys form on life's timeline. 365 million years ago, the dinosaurs ruled the planet. After another 358 million years pass, the first humans inherit what they left behind. In a few million more, those humans begin to use stone tools. The human race learns and develops. They go on to create forms of communication, worship, and sustenance. They establish cultures and societies which drive them forward, allowing for the proliferation of art and technology. Technology! Technology that they use to take them back where they came from. The stars. Little do they know that they are about to go even further. It is now January 12th, 2006. One day before mankind's most complex creation yet is released to the world. One day before the movie Hoodwind releases in theaters. Written and directed by the renowned auteur Corey Edwards, Hoodwinked is a 3D animated, whodunit style, ensemble based crime thriller. It features an extensive list of voice talent, including Anne Hathaway, Patrick Warburton, Glenn Close, and Exhibit as Chief Grizzly. Yo, Exhibit? In 2005? Big fucking deal right here. Guy was in the middle of an iconic run as the host of Pimp My Ride. Yo. Let's go! The film would go on to push the boundaries of what was thought possible with animation at the time. The old, tired 2D animation that was coming out in the years leading up to Hoodwink's landmark release simply couldn't compete with art of this level. Not even today's best 3D animated movies like Coco, Into the Spider-Verse, and yes, even Scoob can touch Hoodwink's empty, dead-eyed PS2 aesthetic. A bold choice that, as you can see, has aged like fine wine. What's that? What about the Lion King 2019, you ask? Take this portrait of a single clown. Oh, that, that movie. Yeah, didn't anybody tell you? That's not animation. That's clearly live action. Duh, it's the live action remake. Have you even seen the Fine Brothers video? Would you consider this a live action film or not? I do believe it's a live action film. Hoodwinked is set in a world inhabited by fairy tale characters, mainly from the story of Little Red Riding Hood, and it surrounds the police investigation of a so-called Goody Bandit. The suspects in the case all give their sides of the story, so we end up getting many different views of one central plotline. The characters' stories overlap at key times which, along with the four separate perspectives, creates that cosmic structure that has done so much for humanity. This structure is what really sets Hoodwinked apart from its competition like Shrek and, if we're being honest, sets it apart from most other great art. The way that the events unfold is perfect, an intricate web that takes its place among movie history's best structures, talking about stuff like Memento and Citizen Kane. The stories stack on top of each other, with the first witness, Lil Red, laying the baseline, while the subsequent stories fill in the gaps left in what we've already seen, while also pushing the plot forward at the same time. If you're one of those people whose entire personality is being into conspiracy theories, then for the love of god do not watch Hoodwinked. This bad boy just goes deeper and deeper, and before you know it, a movie that started like this the one about the girl I has turned into this. That's all part of the constellation of events that make up this movie's divine structure though. Fine, you wanna take the red pill? You wanna fall down this rabbit hole? Well, what if I told you that Red wasn't actually making a goodie delivery at all? That was actually part of a covert mission, on orders from Granny Puckett to move top secret recipes up to the mountain. 
but on her journey, she fell from a cable car and then was chased by a wolf and his squirrel sidekick. She escapes, meets a goat, and rides a minecart through an exploding mountain and arrives back home where she is attacked by the wolf before this super German axe man comes through and attacks the wolf. Right? Wrong. Because what you didn't know was that the wolf was actually a good guy the whole time. Yeah, that's right, he's a journalist. Well, uh, I guess he couldn't be that good of a guy then. But still, he wanted to help Red, not hurt her. Also, turns out that it was him who was responsible for the explosion in the mountain, and when the wolf first got to the house, he found Granny tied up in the closet, so he chose to go undercover, thinking the bandit would return to the house. And what you didn't know beyond all that was that Granny was actually a fucking secret agent who was out shredding pal and fighting Russians in order to, I don't know, defend the integrity of our elections or something. And that's only a fraction of what Hoodwinked has to offer. It all just keeps going deeper and deeper from there, with each character tethered together by preordained destiny. Corey Edwards must have harnessed the most powerful force in the universe, that of course being the power of the astrological signs, in order to weave a story worthy of a higher plane of existence. Seriously man, look into it. All talk of the universe and cosmic scale art aside, I really do like Hoodwinked. What can I say, I think it's fucking funny. The dopey visuals add to that for sure, but the jokes, both visual and dialogue based, land more often than not. Very few animated movies marketed at kids are this funny. I do gotta take some points off for the busted visuals though. I mean, come on, this looks about as good as Frogger. Looking past that though, this movie is just over the top in the right way, and it's paced really well. It moves along despite being the same story told multiple times, and that's pretty impressive. For a while, I felt like this movie was almost an inside joke that I had with my friends, but in recent years it seems like it started to inspire the internet in the same way that Spongebob, Shrek, and B-Movie have. Maybe not to the extent of those things yet, but in a similar deep source of memes mixed with nostalgia kind of way. Despite the United States receiving all of the accolades for this historic achievement in culture and art, it is actually Japan whom we should probably be celebrating. This is because in 1950, Akira Kurosawa, perhaps Japan's and maybe even the world's best ever filmmaker, released a film without which Hoodwinked would have never existed. This is Rashomon. <laughs> For several reasons, Rashomon is one of the most important movies ever made. It won the Golden Lion, Venice Film Festival's top prize in 1951. This win brought global recognition to the movie, Kurosawa himself, and Japanese cinema as a whole. Before Rashomon, Japanese cinema was pretty self-contained. Most of what was being screened in Japanese movie theaters were movies made in Japan, and at the same time the vast majority of Japanese films were not being distributed outside of the country for multiple reasons, including a perceived lack of interest and differing attitudes about the sharing of cultures. Now that's all well and good, but clearly this movie's big contribution to society was its paving the way for Hoodwinked. Hoodwink's cosmically deep structure comes mainly in the form of what is known as a Rashomon sequence, also known as a Rashomon effect. A Rashomon sequence is made up of multiple retellings of the same story from different perspectives, with each version of the story containing differences to the key details. What actually happened is usually an amalgamation of separate elements from each character's account of the events. Plenty of well-known movies have made use of a Rashomon effect, including Gone Girl, The Usual Suspects, and everybody's favorite, The Last Jedi. I actually thought that that one was pretty cool as a way to tell part of a story while also paying homage to the series' roots, as the original trilogy was so heavily inspired by Kurosawa's work. Not saying the story being told was a good one, but the technique was used well. In Rashomon, the story of a samurai's murder is told from the perspective of four witnesses. The woodcutter, the samurai, the samurai's wife, and the bandit. You didn't miss here. Even though the samurai is dead, we still hear his perspective on his own murder via a medium who channels his spirit. Each version of the story differs from one another. For example, the bandit claims to have killed the samurai honorably, setting him free and facing him in combat. 
The samurai claims, however, that he killed himself due to dishonor stemming from the bandit's assault of the samurai's wife. As it turns out, neither of these versions are true. A further layer of complexity is added by the film's framing device. The movie opens on and periodically cuts to the ruined gate of the city of Rashomon, where the woodcutter waits out a storm with two other men, a commoner and a priest. The woodcutter tells the men of his experience at the trial, which took place here in Rashomon three days ago. So that means we are getting a retelling of the retellings. Can any of this be trusted, or has it been warped like in a game of telephone? That's what this movie is about, the ways our brains manipulate and genuinely misremember the truth, and that maybe there is no singular truth to any given event. Truth is a subjective thing that varies from individual to individual. The pouring rain is actually significant here too. Weather is always a symbol in Kurosawa films, with storms representing emotional turbulence and darker sad events on the horizon. I won't say anything about how the movie ends, but what I will say is these segments at the gate bring Rashomon into 3D chess territory. You just don't see this type of shit every day, folks. Like everything Kurosawa made, this movie is masterfully shot and framed in that gorgeous Kurosawa black and white. I don't know, there's just something specific about the particular black and white cinematography in his movies that is just so much more appealing than other black and white films. There's just gotta be something to that. Oh, and you can't talk about Kurosawa without bringing up Toshiro Mifune. Mifune plays Tojimaru, the bandit, in Rashomon, but that's just one of many roles he played in Kurosawa films. In total, the two would go on to collaborate on 16 movies, with my personal favorite being High and Low, where Mifune plays an executive whose chauffeur's son is taken hostage. Mifune's filmography is next level, and that mixed with him being a charismatic class act and also having bonkers range and ability as an actor, puts him in GOAT territory. One of the best. Having said all of that, you could go even deeper in terms of inspiration as Rashomon itself was based on a Japanese short story known as In a Grove. The story, written in 1922 by Ryo Nisuke Akutagawa, might have butchered that one, is very similar to Rashomon, although it includes seven different perspectives. This is a storytelling technique that's been around for a while and has continued to evolve until it was finally perfected with Hoodwinked. It's fitting that it was Kurosawa who first brought Japanese film to the rest of the world, as he had long been criticized for straying from traditional Japanese filmmaking norms and techniques. In fact, the Japanese government was not happy that Rashomon was the Japanese film in competition at the Venice Film Festival in 1951, and this is because of concerns with Kurosawa's deviance from those traditional norms. That topic could be its own video though, and if you're really curious about what I mean here, check out a Kurosawa film and then watch a film by Yasujiro Ozu, another filmmaking genius in his own right. Critics at the time praised Ozu's work for its adherence to those aforementioned traditional techniques, so comparing one of his joints to Kurosawa should at least give a visual representation of what I'm talking about. Since I forgot to before, I should probably quickly mention that beyond just the multiple perspectives, Hoodwinked also makes use of non-linearity. This is part of a trend that was going on at the time, following the release of Pulp Fiction, also known as Baby's First Real Movie. I'm kidding, but there's a lot of people who are in your face about how this movie changed the way they view cinema. Dudes named Trent and Miles love wearing board shorts and telling you how many Tarantino movies they've seen. Okay guy, have you even seen Hoodwinked? Get the fuck out of my face. Look, all I'm trying to say is that the non-linearity allows the movie to choose when to reveal details, thus keeping the film's riveting mystery intact for much longer. When Hoodwinked came out, something changed. It's no coincidence that technology has progressed at warp speed in the years after its revelation. Those cowards at the Library of Congress still haven't put Hoodwinked on the National Film Registry, which really is a crime that probably should be prosecuted in a state with outdated laws, if you know what I mean. It may be physically painful to look at it sometimes, but it's a pretty small price to pay for enlightenment. For a long time, it looked like Hoodwinked would never be topped. When the world needed him most, Corey Edwards vanished. Finally, in 2011, you returned, Corey, and you had something with you, something no one else had. You had something they didn't, something no one saw but me. Can you guess? Hoodwinked 2. 